It's not so much the title, Christmas, it's just what it reminds us of, the birth of Christ. Um, I've entitled this Thoughts From and About the Desire of Ages. How many have ever read the book called The Desire of Ages? Okay, that's just about half of us, a little better than half. Um, for those of you that haven't, I'm going to share portions of um, two chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 4. Um, the Desire of Ages, what's the title of the book about? Who's the Desire of Ages, or what is the Desire of Ages? Christ is, right? So the book itself <coughs> is about Jesus Christ. And if we haven't we, if we haven't found that he truly is the desire of, of all age, whatever century you were born in, um, then we've, we've missed so much about Jesus. Um, we're missing life. So there's a couple of, there's several thoughts in this book that um, I want to bring to our attention. I'm not reading the chapters all the way through, I'm skimming through them. I've highlighted them. Um, now you might think this is a cheap way and a simple way to get out of doing a sermon. <laughs> um, but I happen to believe that the person of this book is inspired. Um, and that they wrote about Jesus Christ who they personally knew very well. I'm, I could never outdo that in a sermon. So this is why I share these parts. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love. To be God with us. <clears throat> God with us, Emmanuel, brings comfort, should bring comfort to us. Knowing that whatever situation we find ourselves in, whatever experience we're going through, God is with us. He will never leave us alone. Somebody is always there, and that's him. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. I thought about that for a long time. Angels dwell in the presence of God. But there's something about him that Jesus needed to reveal, even to them, to the angels. He was the word of God, God's thoughts made audible. In his prayer for his disciples, he said, I have declared unto them thy name, your name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Do you know that God? Is that the God that you come here every Sabbath to worship? Is that the God that you know that when you kneel, when you have your morning devotions, your evening devotions, whenever it is, is that the God that you know? Is he gracious? Is he long-suffering? That the love wherewith thou hast loved me, Jesus says, may be in them and I in them. 
but not alone for his earth-born children was this revelation revealed. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which the angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. There's something about God's, the depth of God's love that even the angels needed to see more clearly. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It'll be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it'll be seen that the law of renouncing love, of self-renouncing love, is the law of life from earth to heaven, for earth to heaven. And that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. And that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwells in the light which no man can approach unto. Sin has marred God's perfect work. Yet that handwriting remains. Even now all created things declare the glory of his excellence. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. The angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the loss into a fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. By turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. In heaven itself, this law was broken. Sin originated in self-seeking Lucifer, the covering cherub, desired to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings to draw them away from their creator and to win their homage to himself. Therefore, he misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. With his own evil characteristics, he sought to invest the loving creator. Thus he deceived angels. Thus he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness. Because God is a God of justice and terrible majesty, Satan caused them to look upon him as severe and unforgiving. Again, I've asked the question, what's the God that you worship like? the people that you've shared Christ with? Have you shared this type of God, one that's loving, one that's forgiving, one that's long-suffering? Thus he drew men to join him in the rebellion against God, and the night of woe settled down upon the world. The earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy dunes might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. And this could not be done by force because the exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love. And love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. 
His character must be manifest in contrast to the character of Satan. And this work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height, the depth, and the love of God could make it known. So upon this world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healings in his wing. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which has kept, been kept in silence throughout all eternity. It was an unfolding of the principles that the eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence, and he made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. But this was a voluntary sacrifice. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice of mysterious import was heard in heaven from the throne of God. Lo, I come. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. In these words is announced the fulfillment of the purpose that had been laid hidden from eternal ages. Christ was about to visit our world and to become incarnate. He says, a body thou hast prepared me. Had he appeared with the glory that was his with the Father before the world was, we could not have endured the light of his presence that we might behold it and not be destroyed, the manifest, manifestation of his glory was shrouded. His divinity was veiled with our humanity. Invisible glory in the visible human form. This great purpose had been shadowed forth in types and symbols. The burning bush in which Christ appeared to Moses revealed God. The symbol chosen for the representation of the deity was a lowly shrub that seemingly had no attraction. This enshrined the infinite. The all-merciful God shrouded his glory in a most humble type that Moses could look upon it and live. So in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, God communicated with Israel, revealing to men his will, and imparting to them his grace. God's glory was subdued and his majesty veiled that the weak vision of finite man might behold it. So Christ was to come in the body of our humiliation, in the likeness of men. In the eyes of the world, he possessed no beauty that they should desire him, Yet he was the incarnate God, the light of heaven and earth. His glory was veiled, his greatness and majesty were hidden, that he might draw near to sorrowful, tempted men. Since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials, sympathizes with our griefs. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our Creator is the friend of sinners. For in every doctrine of grace, every promise is the friend of sinners. I'm sorry. Um, every deed of love, every divine attraction presented in Jesus' life on earth, we see in God with us. Satan represents God's law of love as a law of selfishness. He desires that it is impossible for us to obey its precepts. The fall of our first parents with all the woe that has resulted, he charges upon the Creator, leading men to look upon God 
as the author of sin and suffering and death. Jesus was to unveil this deception. As one of us, he was to give an example of obedience. For this, he took upon himself our nature and passed through our experiences and all things that behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. If we were to bear anything which Jesus did not endure, then upon this point Satan would represent the power of God as insufficient for us. Therefore, Jesus was in all points tempted as we are. He endured every trial to which we may be subjected to. And he exercised in his own behalf no power that is not freely given to us. As man, he meant temptation and overcame it in the strength given him from God. As he went about doing good and healing all who were afflicted by Satan, he made plain to men the character of God's law and the nature of his service. His life testifies that it is possible for us to obey the law of God. By his humanity, Christ touched humanity. By his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of God. God with us is a surety of our deliverance from sin, the assurance of our power to obey the law of heaven. In stooping to take upon himself humanity, Christ revealed a character, the opposite of the character of Satan. But he stepped still lower in the path of humiliation. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As the high priest laid aside his gorgeous pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress of the common priest, so Christ took the form of a servant and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Christ was treated as we deserved, that we might be treated as he deserved. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes, we are healed. By his life and his death, Christ achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. I thought about that one for a while as well. If Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, we wouldn't know, perhaps, the depths of Christ. Our relationship would not be quite as tight as what it will be if we hadn't fallen. I thought, that's an odd thought, isn't it? But there was something that the angels needed to see, something that, has be that has now will become their science and their study throughout an eternity. And that is, again, God's love. Knowing and studying who he is as revealed in his love. In taking our nature, which is another part of the more um, um, closely united to Christ, that, the God that we, that we have, in taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one with the human family 
forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill in his word. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same into the highest heaven. In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. The exaltation of the redeemed will be an eternal testimony to God's mercy. By love's self-sacrifice, the inhabitants of earth and heaven are bound to their creator in bonds of indissolvable union. <clears throat> you know, these are words that I can read. These are words that, you, that we can hear. I have a hard time understanding the depth of that, though. What does it mean for us to be bound so close to God in something that becomes, uh, that will be indissolvable? What is that, what's the depth of that mean? We may not know exactly this side of eternity. But there's something that God has always wanted with us. That's why we were created. And he's taken this step, it's an unbelievable step, that we celebrate this time of year to make it happen, to bring it about. Such a relationship with him that you and I have a challenge understanding what it, what it truly means. Our little world under the curse of sin as one dark bot in his glorious creation will be honored above all other worlds in the universe of God. Here where, where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And through endless ages, how long is that? <laughs> through endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift, Emmanuel, God with us. Just parts of chapter 4. The king of glory stooped low to take humanity. Rude and forbidding were his earthly surroundings. His glory was veiled that the majesty of his outward form might not become an object of attraction. He shunned all outward display. Riches, worldly honor, human greatness can never save a soul from death. Jesus purposed that no attraction of earthly nature should call men to his side. Only the beauty of heavenly truth must draw those who would follow him. The character of the Messiah had long been foretold in prophecy, and he desired men to accept him upon the testimony of the word of God. How backwards in our thinking today. We have to be attracted. You have to be beautiful in order for me to fall in love with you. I have to be rich in order for you to pay any kind of attention to me or to give me any kind of status whatsoever. Jesus took the opposite route. You, we will fall in love with him because of the description that we read about him in the scriptures. The angels had wondered at the glorious plan of redemption. They watched to see how the people of God would receive his son clothed in the garb of humanity. And with amazement, the heavenly messengers beheld 
the indifference of the people whom God had called to communicate to the world the light of sacred truth. The Jewish nation had, pres had been preserved as a witness that Christ was to be born of the seed of Abraham and, and of David's line, yet they knew not that his coming was now at hand. In the temple, the morning and evening sacrifice daily pointed to the Lamb of God. Yet even here, there was no preparation to receive him. The priests and the teachers of the nations knew not that the greatest event of the ages was about to take place. They rehearsed their meaningless prayers and performed the rites of worship to be seen by men. But in their strife for riches and worldly honor, they were not prepared for the revelation of the Messiah. The same indifference pervaded the land of Israel. Hearts, selfish, and world engrossed were untouched by the joy that thrilled heaven. Only a few were longing to behold the unseen. And to these, heaven's embassy was sent. Out of Bethlehem, said the prophet, shall he come forth, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth has been from of old, from the days of eternity. But in the city of the royal line, Joseph and Mary are unrecognized unre and unhonored. Weary, homeless, they traverse the entire length of the narrow street, from the gate of the city to the eastern extremity of the town, vainly seeking a resting place for the night. There was no room for them at the crowded inn. And in a rude building the, where the beasts are sheltered, they at last find refuge, and here the Redeemer is born. Above the hills of Bethlehem are gathered an innumerable throng of angels. They wait the signal to declare the glad news to the world. Had the leaders pastors in Israel been true to their trust, they might have shared in the joy of heralding the birth of Christ, but now they are passed by. To those who are seeking for light and who accept it with gladness, the bright rays from the throne of God will shine. In the fields where the boy David had led his flock, shepherds were still keeping watch by night. Through the silent hours they talked together of the promised Savior and prayed for the coming of the king to David's throne. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. At these words, visions of glory filled the minds of the listening shepherds. The Deliverer had come to Israel. Power, exaltation, triumph are associated with his coming. But the angel must prepare them to recognize the Savior in poverty and humiliation. This shall be a sign unto you, he says. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The heavenly messenger, messenger had quieted their fears. He had told them how to find Jesus with tender regard for their human weakness. He had given them time to become accustomed to divine radiance. Then the joy and glory could no longer be hidden and the whole plain was lighted up with the bright shining of the host of God. Earth was hushed, and heaven stooped to listen to that song, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I thought of that one, too. <clears throat> you know how... You, you, you're you going to burst through when your daughter becomes pregnant, right? And you want everybody to know that you're going to be a grandpa. 
But we were told a month back, right? Almost a month ago, we were told, and we were told, you can't say nothing. <laughs> and so in that month's time, we knew, but couldn't say nothing, you know? And I told Kiana, you know how hard it is to, to be with your friends that you are close to, and they are close with you, and not say nothing? <clears throat> So these angels, they're getting ready, you know, for the Messiah. The Messiah has been, has been birthed. He's been born. And they're, they're keeping back. They're bursting forth. And then all of a sudden, it's all let loose, you know. And the whole uh, mountainside lights up in divine radiance. What joy it must have been for them. And we still don't get the depth of it. We still miss so much of it. She continues, Oh, that today the human family could recognize that song. The declaration then made that the note then struck will swell to the close of time and it will resound to the end of the earth. When the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, that song will be re-echoed by a voice of a great multitude as a voice of many waters, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. As the angels disappeared, the light faded away, and the shadows of night once more fell upon the hills of Bethlehem. But the brightest picture ever beheld by human eyes remained in the memory of the shepherds. Ever been in a dark room, turned off the light bulb, but the light still reflects in your, in your mind's eye? It's still there. Everything else is dark around you. Can imagine how long of a time the angels lived with that memory hanging in there. <clears throat> Departing with great joy, though, they made known the things that they had seen and heard. And all that they had heard it wondered, all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Mary kept all these things, pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying God. Heaven and earth, are no wider apart today than when the shepherds listened to the angel's song. Humanity is still as much the object of heaven's solicitude as when common men of common occupations met the angels at noonday and talked with the heavenly messengers in the vineyards and the fields. To us, in common walks of life, heaven may be very near. Angels from the courts above will attend the steps of those who come and go at God's command. The story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it is hidden the depth of the riches of both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We want to know more about God, the depth of his wisdom, the depth of his knowledge. Study the birth. Study Bethlehem. Study again what this season represents. We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for a manger, the companionship of adoring angels for the beast of the stall. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. Yet, this was but the beginning of his wonderful condensation. And then that favorite quote, it would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take the nature of man even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened 
by 4,000 years of sin. And like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of hereditary. What these results are are shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a hereditary to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us an example of a sinless life. Satan in heaven hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. He hated him the more when he, de when he himself was dethroned. He hated him who pledged himself to redeem a race of sinners. Yet into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight at the risk of failure and eternal loss. The heart of the human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and he trembles. at the thought of life's perils. And he longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power. To meet a bitterer conflict. I'm sorry. And to hold him back from temptation and conflict. To meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk God gave his only begotten son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones here in his love. Wonder, O oh heavens, and be astonished, O oh earth. <clears throat> I skimmed through, probably seemed long and laborious, <clears throat> I would highly recommend <clears throat> reading those chapters um, in the quiet of your own home and in the quietness of your own mind and heart. Tremendous chapters that vividly help us to understand a little bit more of our salvation and of our Savior. <clears throat> I highly recommend it. I don't believe you'll be disappointed.